So greetings from my side. I am myself Dr. Vivek Kumar Sharma. I am working as Dean, Professor and Head of Department of Physiology, Government Institute of Medical Sciences, Greater Noida, Uttar Pradesh. So today we are going to talk about the physiology of the calcium and phosphate homeostasis. Introduction. Calcium is the most abundant mineral after carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen and it roughly makes around 2% of the body weight or 1 to 1.5 kgs in an adult. Essentially speaking, the metabolism of calcium and phosphate, it revolves around three hormones, three organs and three cells are involved. The three hormones are parathyroid hormone, calcitonin hormone, vitamin D which is also called as 125-dihydroxychol-calciferol. Three organs are the intestines, bones and kidney and the three cells which are involved are the osteoblasts, osteoclasts and osteocytes. Then there is also one fourth hormone that is parathyroid hormone related peptide which essentially plays an important role in the skeletal development in the utero itself. <coughs> So, how the distribution of the calcium occurs in the body? Roughly, we have total body content of 1 to 1.5 kgs and nearly 99% of it is totally present in the bones and the teeth. ICF is uh, roughly around 0.9% and in extracellular fluid, it is roughly around 0.1%. So, the plasma calcium level, to remember it is, either it is 10 mg or 5 milliequivalent or 2.5 millimoles per liter. So 10, 5, 2.5, 10 milligram per deciliter, the range can be somewhere around 8.5 or 8 to 11 or 9 to 11 milligram per cent. <clears throat> now this calcium is actually present, 50% of the calcium is present in the free ion, that is the active form and rest 50% is present in the stored form, that is the bound form and it is the inactive pool, which does not participate in most of the reactions. And the intestinal absorption of calcium varies with the intake. And this is called as the calcium adaptation. That is again a property of the calcium absorption. So now let's see how this is metabolized within the body. So roughly we take around 25 millimoles in the diet and nearly 2.5 is gained by the body and overall after the metabolism feces in feces we lose roughly 22.5 moles millimoles in uh, ecf then from the git it goes to the extracellular fluid and there is an absorption and as well as the secretion into the git then there is also the loss of it into the kidney through the kidney and then we have one important property is that this from the extracellular fluid when it goes to the bone we have two types of the pools within the bone one is the exchangeable pool and another is the stable pool in the exchangeable pool we have a slow absorption and as well as the the accretion and the reabsorption from the bones into the extracellular fluid it keeps occurring which is a small pool or which is a slow slow pool then we have a rapid exchange pool which is roughly 500 millimoles uh, and this will be utilized by the body for the absorption into the bone <clears throat> then there is a stable pool this stable pool does not participate in most of the reactions functions of the calcium we know that calcium plays a very important role in multiple metabolic reactions for example genesis and maintenance of the action potentials genesis of the pacemaker potential within the heart and the excitation contraction coupling in the muscles cell division and mineralization of the bones excitability of the nerve and muscle and the secretion of the endocrine and exocrine glands all in all of these calcium is involved then the neurotransmitter release cannot occur unless and until calcium moves into the presynaptic vesicles and the, then these vesicles fuse and then the neurotransmitter is released blood coagulation again it plays a very important role then the modulation of the activity of various enzymes 
and also it plays a very important role as a second or the third messenger in various intracellular signaling pathways for the hormone actions. Then GI motility is also affected by the calcium and the structural support and locomotion due to which we can we have a stable structure, we can walk, we can move and we can perform activities. For that the calcium is extremely important. Coming to distribution of phosphate in the body, the total body, body content is roughly 500 to 800 grams. In bones and teeth it is roughly 85 to 90 percent. In intracellular fluid roughly 85 percent and in the extracellular fluid 0.08 percent. So, Phosphate is primarily located intracellularly. Then the plasma phosphate level is 11 to 12 milligram percent. Two third of it is present in the organic compounds and one third as the inorganic phosphate, which is like phosphate, then HPO4 2 minus and H2PO4 minus. Functions of the phosphate. So, it is present in the uh, ATP, creatine phosphate, various cofactors like NAD, NADP and thymine pyrophosphate and it is an integral part of the cyclic AMP and uh, inositol triphosphate. It is also found in the DNA and RNA and phosphorylation of the intracellular proteins are very important step for the activation of any of the reactions occurring within the cell. And it is a covalent modifier of many enzymes and of course it is present along with the calcium in the bone and teeth. And intracellular pH buffering system, it is one of the commonest or the most important buffer system. So what is the regulation of this calcium and phosphate metabolism? Let's come on to that now. So the control of the calcium and phosphate can be at the level of the intestine. As we have just discussed that there is a calcium adaptation at the level of intestine itself. So the calcium is primarily absorbed from the via the active transport in the duodenum and jejunum and vitamin D that is the active form of which is 125 dihydroxychol calciferol plays a very important role in the absorption of the calcium from the intestine and also there is a passive diffusion in the ileum. Now coming to the phosphate absorption, now the inorganic phosphate absorption which is roughly 75 to 85% of the total intake is linear to the dietary intake and mainly from the duodenum and both active and the passive diffusion play their part in the absorption of phosphate. So coming to next that is the kidney. What is the renal control of the calcium and phosphate? The reabsorption of the Nef in the nephron it occurs uh, for this filtered calcium it primarily the 98 percent is reabsorbed back into the plasma. Now the absorption in of calcium in the nephron occurs primarily from the proximal tubule and uh, 65 percent in proximal tubule, 25 percent in the loop of Henle and 8 percent in the distal tubule. And the filtered phosphate is roughly 75 to 85 percent is reabsorbed back and nearly most of it is absorbed from the proximal convoluted tubule 70 percent or so. So there is an but the parathyroid hormone plays a very important role in the absorption uh, of the calcium and phosphate from the kidney. So parathyroid hormone plays two different roles. Parathyroid hormones, it increases the plasma calcium level by acting on the distal tubule and it causes a decrease in the absorption of the phosphate ion by acting on the proximal convoluted tubule and preventing the absorption of the phosphate ions from the proximal convoluted tubule. Coming to very very basics of bone physiology so that we can discuss about some of the applied aspects of it. So the functions of bones we all know that it forms the skeletal framework, stable postural background, locomotion, metabolism of various minerals especially calcium phosphates and magnesium are there. So it protects the important structures and the viscera and protects all the internal organs of the body and bone marrow is the primary site of hemopoiesis which is located within the bone itself. 
So the composition of the bone is that it is comprised uh, mainly of the inorganic compounds which has calcium 99% and then various other and phosphate 86% various other minerals are present. In the organic matrix which is called as the osteoid it is primarily composed of type 1 collagen that forms nearly 95% of the bone matrix and then there is ground substance that is roughly 5% of the bone matrix and then there are pro this ground substance which 5% these are actually the proteoglycans and also the high molecular weight substance. So coming to the structure of the bone, we have two, we have two types of the bones that is the cortical or the compact bone or the spongy bone. The cortical or the compact bone it is usually in the outer cortex and it consists of the dense concentric outer layers of the long bones thinner outer layer of the flat bones and it constitutes roughly 80% of the total bone mass. Whereas the inner trabeculae or the spongy bone consists of the bony spicules and it constitutes roughly 20% of the total bone mass. So compact bone is roughly around 80%. It has large number of the osteocytes which are quiescent, they are not active. It has low metabolism. The nutrition is provided by the haversian canals and what do we see is that there are concentric layers which are formed of collagen and these are called as the osteons or the haversian systems and uh, it contains the uh, calcium and the phosphate hydroxyapatite crystals. So these they will form the outer core and they are they are usually they are protective in nature and as well as we have the compact bone which contains these uh, haversian canals. Then in the center or the core, we have the 20% of the total mass is this trabecular bone. It is a metabolically active bone and the nutrients will diffuse from the extracellular fluid and that is how this uh, trabecular bone works. And the loss of the organic matrix leads to the brittle bone. If we consider to the parts of it, we have the epiphysis, we have over here the epiphyseal plate and then we have the long bone that is the diaphysis. So when the growth occurs due to the action of the hormones, especially at the time of the puberty, this epiphyseal plate activity will keep occurring that leads to an increase in the vertical growth or the stature of the human being. And there is also continuous bone remodeling keeps occurring. The, the and due to which there is uh, depends upon in the strain and the strain on the skeletal system and the strain and the stress on the skeletal system will cause the bone remodeling. So we have three types of the uh, cells within the bone that is the osteoblasts, osteoclasts and osteocytes. Osteoblasts and osteocytes are the osteoprogenitor cells and they develop from the primitive cells whereas the osteoclasts they develop from the monocytes and the tissue macrophages. So osteoblasts are the bone forming cells they are modified fibroblasts and they are present at the bone periphery and uh, they uh, these synthesize and secrete the osteoid towards the interior of the bone and these osteocytes when they are produced by the osteoblasts the osteoblasts surrounded by mineralized osteoid lose their ability to form bones and they become the osteocytes. The cytoplasmic connection between the osteoblasts and osteocytes they cause they become the canaliculi. So they transfer the nutrients these and chemicals and the waste products. So what are osteoclasts? Osteoclasts they actually belong to the mononuclear phagocyte system they are large and multinucleated cells. They cause the bone resorption by secreting the proteolytic enzymes. And acidic secretions of the osteoclasts enhances the solubility of the bone, bone minerals. And these enzymes which are secreted, they cause the degradation of organic matrix. So in the homeostasis, there is always a fine balance between the bone formation and the bone destruction. So osteoblasts will continue to produce the bone and osteoclasts will erode wherever we need to change the bone structure. So this is how the osteoclast works. See this is how the osteoclast comes up uh, once uh, it comes onto the bone 
and then you know this we can see this is the ceiling zone over here and then this osteocyte osteoclast comes and then it contains large number of the acid hydrolases and these acid hydrolases will then come over here and they will start causing the release of the enzymes and they will also cause the proteases will be also be released so they will start causing the erosion of the bone within this ceiling zone area and this this uh, it, so this will there will be acid hydrolysis will cause the release of the hydrochloric acid and the ph starts reducing ph even comes to the level of 4 and then then proteases will also cause the degradation of the organic matrix and due to which we find that this pit is created and this bone resorption keeps occurring and due to the bone resorption we find that there will be substances that will be eroded then this this erosion of the substances then for example the hydroxyprolines and the pyridinolines these are produced and they will be then they go to the blood and applied part is that this urine pyridinolines and hydroxyprolinuria are the marker of the bone resorption and they can be measured so this is how it looks like the ceiling zone looks like and the osteoclast will perform its action of causing the bone erosion then the osteoblast will come and will cause the deposition of the new bone on this area so there is a balance which is maintained between the bone resorption and the formation mechanism coming to the applied osteoporosis the osteoporosis is a very common condition and the basic pathophysiology is that there is reduction in the bone density and the bone mass so one of the most common causes that it is involutional osteoporosis and it commonly occurs in the vertebra hip bones and in the distal forearms and uh, there can be multiple causes of that which can be like cigarette smoking alcoholism and the deficiency of the vitamin c primarily the deficiency of the dietary calcium then there can be other causes like hyperparathyroidism or the cushing syndrome and how do we treat it we give not only calcium but we also give the vitamin d tablets and in the menopausal state when there is an accelerated loss of the calcium and phosphate from the body the hormone replacement therapy is also given to prevent or to arrest the osteoporosis in in the females so this is how it looks like the normal bone structure looks like this and this is how the osteoporotic bone looks like we can clearly see the matrix is totally broken and we find that even it is involutional involution has occurred and uh, this is how it looks like the normal trabecular bone trabecular bone with the resorption area as it has started and what we see over here is the osteoporotic trabecular bone as compared to the normal bone next comes the osteopetrosis now we want a balance between the bone destruction and the fresh bone formation so when the bone resorption is defective due to the decreased osteoclastic activity and the unopposed osteoblastic activity what will happen that there will be increase in the bone deposition and there will be loss of the bone destruction due to which all the foramen which are there they will become more and more narrow and due to which the crowding of the vessels and the nerves will occur in the areas when they pass from the foramen so this pressure compression on the nerves will cause the neurological deficits and the due to the pressure on the vessels it will cause the hematological abnormalities so this are the these are the patho, these are the features of the osteopetrosis so now let us discuss about the physiology of the parathyroid hormone parathyroid gland it develops at the 10th week of the pregnancy from the third and fourth brinkel pouches the total weight is just 200 mg that is each 50 mg into 4 and that is 3 into 6 into 2 mm and the blood supply is from the thyroid arteries this is what we can see that this is how this parathyroid gland looks like so this has one n terminal and another one is the c terminal and the parathyroid hormone is a polypeptide hormone 
which has roughly around 84 amino acids. Coming to the structure of the parathyroid gland, we find that there is a single chain polypeptide and it has the calcium regulating ability and it is synthesized as pre-prohormone like other uh, protein uh, polypeptide hormones. Pre-proparathyroid hormone is converted to pro-parathyroid hormone and that gets converted into parathyroid hormone that has 84 amino acids which is the active form. Now in the parathyroid gland we have actually two types of the cells. One is the chief cell and the other one is the oxyphil cell. The chief cells are abundant in the gland and these chief cells are going to produce the parathyroid hormone. Whereas the oxyphil cells which are present usually at the puberty, their function is unknown. So chief cells are going to produce the parathyroid hormone. Coming to the physiological actions of the parathyroid hormone. So we have three main organs. The one is bone, another kidney and another GIT. So the main action of the parathyroid hormone is on the kidneys. And as we have discussed that it will cause the changes in the absorption of the calcium and phosphate from the kidney. In the bone also it has its main effect where it again causes the demineralization that means it causes the osteolytic action on the bone. And from the GIT it has an indirect effect primarily via the vitamin D or the active form that is the 125 dihydroxycol calciferol. And ultimately the net effect will be that it causes an increase in the plasma calcium level and a decrease in the phosphate level. So it causes when there is a parathyroid hormone increase level, it will cause hypercalcemia, hypophosphatemia and there will be an increase in the loss of the phosphate. So it is phosphaturic in nature. So when there is a decrease in the blood calcium level, it is going to be sensed by the calcium sensing receptors within the parathyroid gland and they will via the mediation of the cyclic AMP and phosphokinase C they will start causing the release of the parathormone. Parathormone will act on its target organs and will ultimately cause an increase in the blood calcium level. So and whenever there is an increase in the phosphate levels it will combine with the calcium ions to give rise to calcium phosphate and that ultimately leads to a decrease in the free ionic calcium. And then this decreased free ionic calcium will cause hypocalcemia and this will again stimulate the calcium sensing receptors to cause an increase in the release of the parathormone. So on the receptors, there are three types of receptors for parathormone. The type 1 is PTH1R that binds to both the parathyroid hormone and parathyroid hormone related polypeptide. And its regulation of the plasma calcium by the parathormone is mediated primarily by this type of the receptor or type 1 receptor. Type 2 receptor actually binds to parathormone but it does not bind to parathormone related polypeptide. And it is found in the brain, pancreas and placenta. Type 3 is CPTH. It reacts only with the carboxy terminal of the parathormone. So in the mechanism of action, when the parathormone or parathyroid hormone related polypeptide in the adult, especially parathormone related polypeptide is more important in the pathophysiological states. So it will act on the G protein coupled receptors and the, via the stimulation of the activated G protein, it is going to cause the stimulation of the adenylyl cyclase enzyme activity that converts the ATP to cyclic AMP and also there is an increase in the activity of the phospholipase C. This phospholipase C will then cause the Con, will will cause the activation of this phospholipase phosphoenostal diphosphate to diacylglycerol that gives rise to the production of the phosphokinase C that mediates the actions of the parathormone. It also causes an increase in the inositol triphosphate that causes the release of the calcium ions from the endoplasmic reticulum and this will help in the mediation of the action. So both these the cyclic AMP as well as the phosphokinase C participate in the action of the parathormone. So now let's see how parathormone acts, acts on the bone. Parathormone will ultimately act on the bone to cause an increase in the calcium level. 
So how does it act? It does not directly act on the osteoclast, but actually it acts on the osteoblasts. So the monocytes will give rise to the osteoclyte precursors. And these osteoclast precursors, they contain rank ligand that is attached to them. So the parathormone will come and parathormone will act on, the, on its receptors that are present on the osteoblasts. And due to this, the osteoblasts, they get activated and they will start uh, releasing the substance called as rankle. This rankle goes and it combines with this rank ligand and this causes the activation of the osteoclast precursor. And this gets now activated to give rise to the mature osteoclasts. And then this mature osteoclast will then come onto the bone and they will cause the bone erosion by the formation of the sealing zone. And then there will be a loss of the calcium from the bone that causes an increase in the hypercalcemia. And these osteoclasts will keep on working and they will keep on forming the erosion of the bone. Now, there is another mechanism that is present in the body to check the activity of these osteoclasts. When there is these, uh, when there is too much of the excess of the osteoclast, the osteoblasts secrete another substance called as the osteoprotegerin and or OPG that has the ability to go and bind with the excess amount of the ranks. So when it binds with these ranks, they will not be available to be reacted with this, uh, to react with this rankle. And in that way, the osteoclast activation will be reduced. Calcitonin hormone, it causes the inhibition of the activity of these osteoclasts. Once this erosion has occurred, now we have got this bone where the sealing zones are present and the osteoclasts are there. Now the second part of the activity occurs that is there will be an increase in the osteoblastic activity also. So the stem cell is going to give rise to the pro-osteoblasts that give rise to the mature osteoblast and then they will give rise to the formation of the osteocytes and the laying down of the osteoid in these areas which were the bony erosion areas. Then these will cause these bony erosion areas will be there. And then this bony erosion areas over here in the osteoid, then these will also be stimulated by the, along with the parathyroid hormone, they will be stimulated by the vitamin D3. And then this vitamin D3 and this in this way, the laying of new bone will occur. The applied part is that the rankle OPG or osteoprotegerin ratio in the bone marrow is an important determinant of the bone mass in the normal and as well as in the diseased states. So now coming to the parathyroid action on the kidney. The parathormone will, be no, uh, will, uh, will act on the kidney to cause an increase in the calcium absorption and causing a decrease in the phosphate absorption. So in kidney roughly around 250 millimoles of the calcium ions are filtered into the glomerular filtrate per day. And there is an increase in the calcium absorption from the distal tubule and there is a decrease in the phosphate absorption from the proximal convoluted tubule. And also the parathormone will act on the kidney to cause the stimulation of the 1-alpha hydroxylase enzyme which is, a, is, which is the rate limiting step and as well as a very important step in the activation of the calcitriol hormone or the 125-dihydroxycol calciferol hormone which is the active form of the vitamin D. So when in the proximal tubule there is phosphate is being absorbed in a normal condition but when we are having this uh, parathormone the parathormone will come and it will block the channels and due to which the phosphate cannot go into the from the lumen into the cell and from there into the interstitial fluid leading to the phosphaturia. And on, to, on the other hand, in the distal convoluted tubule, it causes the promotion of the stimulation of this calcium ion absorption from the lumen into the cell and from there into the interstitial fluid. And so there will be increased absorption and decrease in the loss of the calcium in the urine or hypocalciuria will be produced. Now the parathyroid hormone action on the activation of the vitamin D or 125-dihydroxycol calciferol formation. So parathormone is 
is instrumental in the activation of this 1-alpha hydroxylase enzyme that causes the formation of the active form 125-dihydroxy called calciferol. And if this parathormone is not present, even the vitamin D active form will be very difficult to produce by the body. So what we see over here is that uh, the reabsorption of the calcium occurs throughout the body, but there is in this parathyroid hormone causes increase in the calcium absorption primarily in the distal tubule and as well as in the collecting ducts. And that causes decrease in the loss of the calcium ions from the nephron and only 2.5 to 5 millimoles of the calcium ions are lost. 60 to 70 percent are already absorbed in the PCT. So decrease in the plasma calcium will cause increase in the stimulation of the release of the parathormone from the parathyroid gland. Parathormone level increases that causes that in the kidney will cause increase in the calcium absorption. It will also cause an increase in the activation of the 125 dihydroxy called calciferol. Increased calcium absorb will cause hypocalciuria or decreased calcium loss from the from the kidneys or in the urinary loss. And also the increase in the activation of vitamin D will cause increase in the absorption of the calcium primarily from the GIT, gastrointestinal tract. It does so by causing an increase in the synthesis of the calbindins 9K and 28K that we will talk. So there will be an increase in the calcium by the absorption from the intestine and also by causing a decrease in the loss from the kidney. And also the parathormone will act on the bone, the bone resorption will occur that will again cause release of the calcium within the plasma. And all these three factors will cause the restoration of the plasma calcium towards the normal from the hypocalcemia towards the normal calcemic status. When the parathormone is level is present at the higher doses, it inhibits the collagen synthesis by the osteoblasts and therefore it leads to the decrease in the bone mass. But when the parathormone level is present at the lower doses in the optimal doses, it not only causes an increase in the osteoclastic, but it also causes an increase in the osteoblastic activity, increase in the collagen synthesis and therefore increase in the bone mass. Coming to the applied aspects, hyperparathyroidism, that is increase in the parathormone level within the blood. So the one cause, number one cause can be the primary hyperparathyroidism. That means that parathyroid gland itself has the pathophysiology due to which it is causing an increase in the release of the parathormone. So it can occur when there is a tumor, for example, adenoma that will lead to the hypercalcemia and also an increase in the loss of the phosphate leading to the hypophosphatemia and also but there will be also a complete hypercalciuria not on the hypocalciuria it is primarily because there is too much release of the parathormone so there will be obviously hypercalcemia there will be increase in the absorption from the kidney but the absorption system will be overwhelmed due to which there will be increased loss of the calcium from the urine so that is hypercalciuria it can also lead to the uh, accumulation of the calcium within the kidney leading to the renal stones and it actually causes the release of the, the condition called as demineralization of the bone causes the osteitis fibrosa it occurs when there is a chronically higher level of the parathormone so in this condition the bone marrow is fibrosed and there is bone resorption that exceeds the bone formation Secondary hyperparathyroidism means that there is an increase in the parathormone level but it is not due to the pathophysiology within the para parathyroid gland but it is primarily due to the lesion in some other areas or due to the pathophysiology in some other organs. So secondary hyperparathyroidism is usually observed in the case of the chronic renal disease and in the case of the rickets. So when there is decrease in the activity of the parathormone, there will be also a decrease in the 1-alpha hydroxylation that ultimately again will cause a decrease in the vitamin D active formation. There will be lesser action of the parathormone on the nephrons and ultimately this leads to the hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. Now if the kidney is abnormal, the alpha hydroxylase will not be produced. So obviously they, we will find that the calcium level will be decreased. So there will be increased secretion of the parathormone 
due to this hy chronic hypocalcemia and this will lead to the hypertrophy of the parathyroid gland the parathyroid glands will increase in their in their size so that they can compensate for the the decreased activity of the vitamin d within the kidneys so familial hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia just to sum up this applied aspect there can be the inactivating mutations of the parathormon calcium parathyroid gland calcium sensing receptors so if it is homozygous in nature then it can be the fatal condition where there will be neonatal severe primary hyperparathyroidism but when it is heterozygous the the patient will be able to live and it will lead to the familiar benign hypocalciuric hypercalcemia in this condition the plasma calcium is higher however the parathormone level can be normal or it can be increased but when there are activating mutations of the parathormone calcium sensing receptor what happens there be, it leads to the condition called as familiar hypercalciuric hypocalcemia hypercalcemia usually occurs in the cases of the malignancy also and it primarily occurs in the ectopic secretion of the parathormone or the parathormone related polypeptide which contributes to nearly 80% of the hypercalcemia due to the malignancy as it is usually observed in the cancers of the breast kidney lungs ovary and skin so here the parathormone uh, related polypeptide is also comes into the play in the pathophysiology where it can stimulate the pth1 type of the receptors and 20% of the cases can be due to the bony metastasis by the cancer cells and that will cause increase in the osteolytic activity in the bone and that will cause the hypercalcemia now coming on to the opposite that is the hypoparathyroidism we know that parathormone is essential for life and when there is hypoparathyroidism there will be decrease in the level of the calcium in the blood and we also know that calcium is very important for the maintenance of the resting membrane potential of all the excitable cells that is the muscles and the nerves etc so when there is hypoparathyroidism there is also hypocalcemia and there will be increase in the bone deposition and the bone lytic activity will be reduced so there will be increased the bone density but there will be hypocalcemia and the usual cause can be that while doing the thyroid surgery there can be inadvertent parathyroidectomy that is one of the most common cause of the hypocalcemia hypocalcemia now this will lead to the hypo this hypoparathyroidism or decrease in the high, high blood calcium level leads to another situation that is called as tetany or the hypocalcemic tetany now when the blood calcium level is reduced what happens there will be a decrease in the resting membrane potential and so the cells will become more and more excitable and there will be increase in the excitability so this hypocalcemic tetany can be elicited in the clinical situations by the elicitation of these two signs one is the swastik sign and another is the trojo sign the swastik sign means then when we tap on to the angle of the jaw when we tap on the angle of the jaw what happens is that there will be ipsilateral contraction of the facial muscles on that side it occurs because of the increase in the excitability of the muscles and as well as the increased excitability of the nerves on to the ipsilateral side so there will be twitchings there you can easily see that there will be ipsilateral contraction of the facial muscles and we can elicit it in the hypocalcemic situation another condition is the trojo sign when we raise the blood pressure in the arm of the person and we say raise it to 40 mmhg or so in a normal person it should not cause any much of the ischemic reaction but if the hypocalcemia is there then it might lead to the increased excitability of the muscles that can lead to the spasm of the muscles of the upper extremity that causes the flexion of the wrist and the thumb and we also find that uh, there will be the there will be the flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joints but at the interphalangeal joints we find that there will be the extension of the fingers so there will be extension of the interphalangeal joints but there will be the flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joints 
and also we find that there is carpopedal spasm that means there will be the spasm at the level of the ankles that is called as a pedal spasm and this is the change that we see it at the level of the wrist is called as the carp carpal spasm and together these two are called as the carpopedal spasm and this is called as the trochus sign now when it is more severe the hypocalcemic tetany can cause the contraction of the uh, of various smooth muscles where it can give rise to laryngospasm and uh, it can also be life threatening condition so the treatment is that we will give immediately ionized calcium along with the parathormone now hypoparathyroidism in we know that since the parathormone is essential for life it cannot occur it does it need not occur only through the deficiency of parathormone it can also occur when the deficiency or there is inadequate action being produced in the receptors of the parathormone so this is called as pseudo hypoparathyroidism where the parathormone level is normal but what we find is that the receptors are abnormal and type 1 is congenital where the parathormone does not increase the cyclic amp or the inositol tri formation level in the target cells due to the receptor defect type 2 is when the cyclic amp synthesis by the parathormone within the target cells is normal but it fails to produce the phosphaturic effect so both these conditions are going to give rise to the pseudo hypoparathyroidism a coming a small note on the parathyroid parathyroid hormone related polypeptide it is a 140 amino acid uh, polypeptide and it has it is the gene for its production is located on chromosome 12 and its main function is during the pregnancy and during the pregnancy it causes an increase in the chondrocytes uh, production leading to the development of the cartilage and mineralization it acts as a growth factor for the development of the skin hair follicle and breast and uh, it is produced in large quantities in the lactating breast tissue and it is secreted in the milk as well and it is also involved in the calcium transport in the placenta coming to another hormone that is vitamin d now it is defined as the group of closely related sterols that are produced by the action of the ultraviolet light in the body and in foods activated by the ultraviolet radiation so the next question that uh, so here we have three types of the vitamins d that is d1 d2 d3 d1 is the anti rachitic substances that are usually present in the food but it is of historical interest they are not of much importance d2 is calciferol that is present in the irradiated food like in yeast fungi milk bread etc and d3 is the col calciferol that is synthesized from the skin from the the raw substance 7d hydrocholesterol so now next question is whether this 125 dihydroxy col calciferol or calcitriol is it is a hormone or vitamin since we call it as the vitamin d now when we see the properties we should although we say it as vitamin d but it is labeled as a hormone And the reasons are number 1 that it is produced in the body that is in the col calciferol in the skin and ideally it does not need any diet supplementation so if we have adequate exposure then the vitamin d can be produced by the ultraviolet light from the skin itself it is activated in body and transported in the blood stream to produce effects in the target cells and it is also subjected to the feedback regulation by the plasma calcium and its own active form so what are the effects what are the physiological actions of calcitriol so it will act again on the three organs bone kidney and git but its main effect will be on the git and on the bone and lesser effect on the kidney its net effect is going to be an increase in the plasma calcium and in the plasma phosphate level so sunlight acts on the 7d hydrocholesterol present in the skin and that will give rise to the formation of the col calciferol or vitamin d3 and then this is transported along with the vitamin d binding protein to come to the liver and in the liver the 25 hydroxylation occurs then it is now called as 25 hydroxy col calciferol then further it goes to the kidney 
and where the one alpha hydroxylase is present uh, primarily in the proximal convoluted tubule and this gives rise to the active form that is the 125 dihydroxy called calciferol but when we have excess of the calcium in the body then instead of having the one alpha hydroxylation in kidney we have 24 hydroxylase enzyme present and it gives rise to the 24 25 dihydroxy called calciferol which is an inactive form and which prevents the further absorption of the calcium and the phosphate from the from the diet into the blood the important thing to remember is that this hydroxylation that occurs in the kidney is the rate limiting step for the synthesis of the active form of vitamin d3 so what is its mechanism of action so vitamin d3 will come it will act on its receptor it moves like any other sterol it the receptors are located in the cytoplasm it combines and then it moves to the nucleus and in the nucleus it causes the transcription process to start and following the transcription process we have the translation that will occur in the ribosomes and the proteins will be produced that are calbindin d proteins they are pro produced in the git brain and kidneys but mainly in the git from where it causes enhanced absorption of the calcium so like this this calbindin d and their calbindin are of two types the calbindin d can be 9k type or the calbindin d 28k type and within the git the this is for example if the G calcium which is present in the diet so this when there is increase in the activity of vitamin d there will be increase in the introduction of these cell bindings into the luminal surface and from there there will be increase in the absorption of the calcium ions into the interstitium and then this calcium will be absorbed and there will be calcium adaptation level as we have already discussed but for the phosphate we find that there it has its own receptors then these receptors will cause the absorption of the phosphate but there will be a direct uh, relation between the presence of it in the luminal in the lumen due to the diet and its absorption into the interstitium now regulation of the synthesis it is the that is also called as the calcium adaptation occurring at mainly in the git so when there is an increase in the calcium or there is a decrease in the phosphate that means there is a decreased requirement of the calcium what will happen in the kidney there will be 24 25 dihydroxy called calciferol production so that more calbindins are not produced and that will cause decrease in the further absorption of the calcium and phosphate from the git or uh, from the git and if we find that when there is hypocalcemia or hypophosphatemia in these conditions there will be one alpha hydroxylation in the kidney leading to the increase in the formation of calbindin d 9k and 28k leading to an increase in the absorption of the calcium and phosphate from the GIT. So the calcium absorption increases from the distal tubule and the phosphate absorption increases from the proximal convoluted tubule of the nephron. And But the important difference is that the effect is more on the GIT and lesser on the kidney when we compare it to the parathormone. Another thing is that it promotes the recruitment and the differentiation of the osteoclast in the bone remodeling units by inducing the rankle from the osteoblasts. So there will be main effect is the bone mineralization will occur indirectly by maintaining the calcium and the phosphate levels. The direct impact of the vitamin D will be that it causes an increase in the calcium loss from the uh, from the bones and also and there is an increase in the loss but it also promotes the osteoblastic activity so the osteoclast over here what we see that the 125 dihydroxy called calciferol will cause increase in the rankle that will cause increase in the resorption of the bone but at the same time we also see that there is an increase in the osteoblastic activity by laying down of the more of the osteoid within the bone itself now let us discuss about two major disorders, rickets and osteomalacia that are directly linked with the vitamin D deficiency. The basic pathophysiology in these disorders is, the, is that there is inadequate bone mineralization along with the excessive unmineralized osteoid bone. 
simply meaning that the bones which are formed they lack the minerals like calcium and phosphate. Rickets occurs in children and osteomalacia is the mirror disease that is seen in the adults. And rickets primarily involve the bone epiphysis. The pathophysiology of these disorders is like this that uh, in these conditions there is a deficiency of vitamin D. Now we know that vitamin D causes an increase in the blood calcium and phosphate level through absorption of these minerals from the GIT and as well as from the nephrons. In the deficiency of vitamin D there is decreased blood calcium level or hypocalcemia and this hypocalcemia will cause then the stimulation of parathyroid gland to cause the release of parathormone. The parathormone causes an increase in the blood calcium level and decrease in the blood phosphate level and this primarily occurs through the bone resorption. So there is more and more of the bone resorption and to compensate, the, compensate that there is the formation of more and more bone but the new bone which is being formed it lacks calcium and phosphate and due to this the bones which are formed are abnormal and they are unable to bear the weight of the patient and this leads to the rickets and osteomalacia. The clinical features in, this, in these disorders or primarily in the rickets involves the, there are delayed milestones, there is hypotonia, there is tetany because of the increased excitability of the muscles that can also lead to the laryngeal strider. The ligaments that are connecting the bones are loose and so there are loose joints or ligamentous laxity is seen and the patients may have the pot belly that is called as rachitic pot belly. Then there can also be the skeletal deformities. Uh, few of them are like the craniotabies. The craniotabies means that because of the abnormal bone formation, the skull is thinner and it can be pressed and that is called as the craniotabies. Then there can be the frontal bossing. Then there can be the rickety rosary that is seen around the sternum. And then we can have the bored legs, the legs are bored or there can be like this, these are the knock knees. Now this, these primarily occurs because the bones which are formed are abnormal and they cannot bear the weight of the patient. The treatment for vitamin D deficiency rickets involves the adequate dietary supply of the calcium and uh, the adequate sunlight exposure. Now, if these are not sufficient, then vitamin D3 is given orally and in the severe cases, it can also be given intramuscularly along with the calcium supplementation. Coming to the third hormone that is the calcitonin hormone. Calcitonin hormone is a 32 amino acids polypeptide and it is secreted from the parafollicular cells or the C cells of the thyroid gland that uh, develop from the ultimo branchial bodies derived from the fifth branchial pouch. So this, it is derived from the calcitonin gene. Calcitonin gene in the thyroid gland, it gives rise to the, due to the alternative splicing, it gives rise to the calcitonin hormone. And the same gene will be spliced to give rise in, within the nervous system to the CGRP, where it will give rise to the calcitonin gene related peptide which is a very potent vasodilator. So the major stimulus for the secretion of calcitonin is a rise in the plasma calcium level. There can be other causes. One of the major causes from the GIT is the gastrin hormone secretion. The mechanism of action is via the adenylate cyclase or the cyclic AMP system. And G protein coupled proteins are there. And what is the main physiologic action? Its main physiologic action is that it decreases the plasma calcium level. So when so it is a protective, it is protective in nature, it prevents the loss of the calcium from the bones, it decreases the number and the size of the osteoclasts, it decreases the osteoclastic activity, and it inhibits the bone resorption. It will decrease the plasma calcium and as well as the plasma phosphate level. And uh, this plasma phosphate level decreases by the inhibition of the bone resorption and the facilitation of the phosphate entry into the bone. So that will again cause a, and uh, that will 
cause a mild increase in the urinary phosphate excretion also. Thus, the hypophosphatemic effect of the calcitonin is independent of the hypocalcemic effect. So, here we see that calcitonin hormone is going to cause increase, decrease in the activity of the osteoclasts. So, it will inhibit the bone resorption, it will cause hypercalciuria, it, will, it, has, it plays a very important role in the skeletal development, it prevents the postprandial hyperglycemia, pro, pro, protects the bones of the mother during the pregnancy and in the clinical uh, treatment, it is used in the Paget's disease. Uh, to counter the osteoclastic activity forming the disorganized bones. In the Paget's disease, there is too much of the activity of the osteoclast. So, it is countered and uh, this is used clinically in the case of the Paget's disease. So, let's summarize what we have studied in the physiology of the calcium and the phosphate homeostasis. When there is hypercalcemia, 25 hydroxycol calciferol will in the kidney be converted to 24-25 dihydroxycol calciferol that is not active and so the further absorption of the calcium will be reduced whereas when there is hypocalcemia it will cause the in the presence of the parathormone it will be converted to 125 dihydroxycol calciferol or the active form of vitamin D it will act on three organs but primarily on the GIT to cause an increase in the calcium and the phosphate level from the bones and intestine and also from the kidney absorption occurs. So here the increase in the calcium will cause or hypercalcemia will, will depress the release of the parathormone and hyperphosphatemia will again cause the checking of the release of 125 dihydroxycol calciferol. Whenever the vitamin D level increases it also causes inhibitory effect on the parathormone and it also prevents the conversion of the 25 hydroxycol calciferol to 125 dihydroxycol calciferol so due to all these things we find to we have three organs that is the bones intestine and kidney we have three cells osteoblast osteoclast and osteocytes and we have three types of the hormones parathormone and we have the vitamin D or 125-dihydroxycol calciferol or calcitriol and we have calcitonin and all these three hormones will have the interplay to maintain the homeostasis of the calcium and the phosphate. Thank you very much for your patient listening.